report on this. Okay. All right, so I am pleased to introduce Debbie Burnt, who is the Director of Substance-Free Athletics, and later will be joined by Ali Benke, and she's from Lyme, Old Lyme Prevention Coalition, so she can talk specifically about how she implemented the program in her district. Um, as far as Q&A, we're gonna leave time at the end for questions and, um, you know, we're a small group, so if you have like a burning question that you need an answer to right away, feel free to unmute yourself and ask, but otherwise we'll save questions for the end. And if you want to type them into the chat, just to remind yourself what you wanted to ask, feel free to do that. So with that, I will introduce Debbie. Hi, everybody. It's great to be here. Um, I'm assuming we can see my screen okay, right? All right. And um, it's it's a pleasure. We, uh, like Linda said, we met this uh, summer. And let me just make sure I can advance my screen. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay, there we go. Um, and and the reason we were at CADCA is because we had been selected over the course of the year as um, well, in combination with the Lyme Old Lyme Prevention Coalition and Allie, who will be here shortly, um, had been she had been selected as a coalition in action. And then CADCA looks at all of those over the year and selects the top five. And we were actually in that top five with her in her coalition. So it was really exciting to kind of bring the program more broadly to people and let them see what it's all about. Um, we're going to go through a quick overview. We're going to talk about the structure of the program, uh, why we include policy. We're going to go through our science core uh, at a pretty high level, the Protect Your Game Challenge, talk to you about coaches and parents, and, um, and then Allie will be on and she can talk to you more about how she's implemented it at Lime Old Lime, and then we'll do questions and answers. So um, quickly as an overview, the program, let's see, good thing. Um, started about five years ago. I am in prevention. I'm in Northern California. Uh, I am a parent of three. I have a 27, 24, and 19 year old. Um, they all played sports to varying degrees, some very high level, some not. And um, about six years ago, we, my son was playing lacrosse at the time. He was also a football player and his middle school team um, was fantastic. They were a club team, but we would go to tournaments, be winning the tournaments on Saturday and losing the tournaments on Sunday. And we were like, what is going on? We, a couple of parents looked around and we're like, oh, we have 11 of our seventh graders that are using marijuana very heavily on Saturday nights of these tournaments. We live in California. It's a legal state. We had parents in the industry. We had parents supplying it. So we realized this is okay. You know, you assume this isn't great for your kids, but what do we know about drugs and sports? And so we started looking around um, and found out we know a lot. And so we started combining it all and putting it into one place. And then my high school athletic director was also our water polo coach at our local high school. And I went to him and said, okay, we're putting this program together. We'd really like to pilot it. And he was like, whoa, okay, my team, first, first out. And his team was one of the heavier using teams on our campus. So, I mean, I really appreciated his support in that. And, and we had some amazing success with them. That was in 2019. We worked with some other teams as well. And then, as you know, COVID hit. And then we started working kind of across the country and online. And the online thing kind of worked. Um, Allie and I met each other, I think in 2020, maybe 21. And we started rolling out in Lime All Lime and in and, and other places in the country. And it just kind of worked. So here is um, the overview and how we kind of get into it. This program um, is a youth prevention program. We know that successful youth prevention programs are multifaceted. They utilize many voices. They meet kids where they are and they're ongoing, not a one and done. 
We're focused on high school athletics because that is very much where kids are. 60% of students play a sport nationally in high school. Usually in the communities we roll out in, that's even higher. We see 70, 80, 85% of students that are playing. We know inside teams and inside athletics, um, a culture is created and that culture can spill into the general population. And then when we started this program, we realized that nationally, really, we haven't, every school district or state that we've worked with has a really robust guideline already in place that supports substance-free athletics. Um, all of us came from prevention that created the program, so we really appreciated that environmental prevention element, that there are things in the environment that govern our behavior. And when we saw this inside the sports realm, we were just Kind of excited. Um, we also know that coaches have this very unique influence in our kids' lives, and we knew we wanted to leverage that and support it in some way. So the goal of substance-free athletics is to create a commonly a common vocabulary and a commonly understood narrative around drugs and alcohol. We do that in two ways. We bring the latest substance science about drugs and alcohol and the athlete to the high school athlete. It's not being done elsewhere. And then again, we also look at that school policy. Um, the outcomes that we hope for and that we have found is that conversations, future conversations with stakeholders become more productive and that athletes that might be thinking about using have both a rational and a shared basis for choosing not to use. So the stakeholders in high school athletics are not surprising. They're the athletes and their teammates, their coaches and their parents. Um, the benefits, uh, well, there are benefits for each of these stakeholder groups when athletes are, are substance free. Uh, the benefits for athletes themselves center around optimal health and performing at the highest level possible, both individually and as a team. For coaches, we hear that those benefits are around productivity, getting the most out of your efforts, making a greater impact on the team in kids' lives, less wasted energy on that using narrative, and just more enjoyable. For parents, our lives are just easier and less fraught when our kids are not using. Um, and also the interesting thing about these stakeholders is that the NCAA actually recognizes them and calls us their effective prevention partners. We also want kids to understand who might be thinking about playing at that college level that the NCAA is actually quite serious about substance use. We want them to under, to think about it. You know, kids in college are 18 to 22, basically. So, um, the majority of those kids are drug minors, if you will. They're under 21 and it is illegal for them to use. For the kids that are over 21, um, the NCAA just doesn't see drugs and alcohol as safe for kids. So we get started in the program. Excuse me one minute, I did one thing. Okay, um, we get started in the program by recognizing that teams that have users and non-users are just more difficult to manage in terms of the culture itself. A little, if not a lot, gets compromised. You see all kinds of degradation in the non-user experience and team unity. There's just a general distraction from team and performance and goal. And as mentioned earlier, a lot of wasted energy on this using versus non-using narrative. We move towards um, uh, reduction in use on teams, again, by talking about the policy, talking about the substance science, and then talking with each of the stakeholders individually. So ideally, we meet with um, coaches separately, athletes separately, and parents separately. Uh, one of the things I like to point out, especially in this team or athletic context is that perfection is not required, right? It's sports. There's usually a win-lose. Things are a little more binary, but truly any reduction in use on a team we find to be very, very powerful. And we believe the reason is because you're shifting the focus of the team from this using narrative and normalization of use back to the goals of the team and what we're trying to accomplish. We do surveys pre and post for each of the presentations that we do. And we have data that says we are very much transferring knowledge to the various organ the various stakeholders. 
Um, and we find that we are changing opinion, at least in the moment with the athletes. Um, we, we hear, we have this one question, you know, have we changed your opinion about drugs and alcohol since you saw this information? We're not, we're not um, following them long-term. So we don't know if we are having a long-term effect, but in the moment we have 50% of kids that tell us yes, 50% of kids that tell us no. The ones that tell us no always are accompanied by something along the lines of, I always knew alcohol and drugs were bad for me. I'm not a, wasn't ever going to use anyway. This just confirmed what I already knew. The ones that say yes, we see all kinds of comments. Like, I didn't know it was so bad. I didn't know marijuana stayed in my system that long. I won't feel pressure. I'll think twice. So these really kind of, it's, it's like a prevention person handed them a script and said, say these things to me. It's, it's very exciting to see. At least in that moment, we're getting their attention. We have seen from parents that it, we are still 100% useful. Um, okay, so how are we structured? We're for, we have those different stakeholders. All of the materials are, we are presentation based, are available online for free. We have a whole battery of collateral that's available for free as well. And then we host a, um, what we call a Substance Free Athletic Leadership Council um, organization. And it's a group of kids across the country that are like-minded or and or this program's rolling out in their community. And it connects them with other kids that are interested in this topic. We also find ourselves in a tremendous number of partnerships, which we can talk about in a minute. Um, we are usually working with some kind of district personnel, admin, principal, an athletic director is usually very important in this conversation. Sometimes there's wellness personnel as well. And then we work a lot with prevention coalitions. So it's a it's great to be talking to all of you today. Um, for a fee, we can also help um, train, we can help present, we can do more data analysis and various things like that. Um, here's just some of the collateral. This is some of our posters that are out there. We have uh, flyers that are substance oriented and stakeholder oriented, lots of stickers that tend to get handed out. This leadership council um, meets on a quarterly basis. They manage our Instagram account and they do all kinds of projects over the years. Uh, it's been quite impressive what they've accomplished. And then from a partnership standpoint, like I said, yeah, sports is just fun. And when people start thinking about sports, they end up realizing, oh, I know the person that does the local sports commentary or, oh, we we know a sideline reporter that works for ESPN. And so the 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 uh, oh, we know the local pro sports organization and, and all of our local pro sports organizations have these community service divisions. So there's just tremendous there's so many ways in which the program, both Substance Free Athletics and Protect Your Game, um, which is which is another tagline, can be used in combination in the community or in combination with other things going on in the community. Um, okay, so let me back up and just explain that Protect Your Game logo. You saw it through the collateral. That was developed about three years ago with and from that council. So we love getting these kids together, but we actually really use their input from a programming standpoint. And they came up with that title going, this is ours. Substance Free Athletics is a great name, but we are protecting our game. And so it was awesome to have this prevention tagline that that kids wanted to call their own. Um, a couple of years or two years after that, they came up with the Protect Your Game Challenge, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. But I, I guess I just wanted to point out how powerful it is to, to see kids get excited about prevention and start to take ownership of it. Um, okay, so Again, just quickly with policy, if we are um, working with you and or you can do this on your own, we just encourage the policy piece to be included in the presentations to athletes, parents, and coaches. One of the reasons we encourage that is most of us don't know it. And I I always laugh, I, like I said, parent of three kids, was a high school parent for 12 years. 
um, because of an eight year spread between them. And I never read that document. I signed it eight times before I read it and was working on this program. We, it's life's just busy. You know, people are just clicking, getting stuff done. So spending a minute while you have everyone's attention going through it at a very high level can be really valuable. It also helps downstream. Um, and I can say, because I am a parent, um, we can be like the most difficult part of, of youth sports. You know, we, we can get all in a tizzy about our kid not being treated fairly. And so when when the policy is covered and we all know it's covered, it just helps down regulate some of that tizziness that can happen in particular with parents. And then it's just great information to know. So we do a quick summary of what the policy is. We wanna talk about vocabulary. So everyone understands what an infraction is, where these infractions can occur. We want the suspensions and or whatever the consequences are to be articulated. Um, we always say a little bit about prescription drugs because um, a prescription drug is a relationship between an athlete and their doctor. These policies do not govern prescription drugs. Um, generally, there might be uh, some requirement that prescription drugs are held in a nurse's office or are, are accompanied with a drug use form. Um, but anyway, we just we want to make that clear. And then we also want kids to understand that using a prescription drug that's not yours is illegal, um, that selling a prescription drug is a felony. That's not inside school policy, but general narcotics law. Then we move on to the science piece. And what I always like to say is substance-free athletics is not worried about the morality of drugs and alcohol, the social justice of drugs and alcohol. We just want kids to understand the facts, the biomechanics of these substances so they can be making the decisions they want to be making. Alcohol has always been around kids. They've always had to make decisions about it. Marijuana increasingly in legalized states in particular, it's everywhere, but in our legalized states, it's really everywhere. And so they have to make decisions. So we want these drugs to be real. We start with alcohol. We want them to know it's a depressant, that it makes you drunk in a nonspecific way, that it's water soluble, that the impacts are physical relative to alcohol. It constricts metabolism. It makes weight difficult to maintain. It inhibits nutrient absorption, which decreases the uh, your ability for your body to repair. This is a big theme throughout drugs and alcohol. They compromise your ability to recover as an athlete in a variety of ways, and they increase the chance of inju injury. They disrupt sleep, or alcohol does, and hydration. We know research-wise that use of alcohol within 24 hours of of, of a physical activity significantly reduces aerobic performance, and this is the one that always gets everyone's attention. Weekly use of alcohol doubles the rate of injury. So, you know, so we ask athletes, so what does that mean? Weekly use is weekend use. That beer on a Friday or Saturday night might not just be a beer on Friday or Saturday night. Now, to be realistic, not everyone's going to show back up at practice and get hurt, but it doubles the chance of that happening. Quite significant, right, from a statistical standpoint. We go on with marijuana marijuana. We want them to understand that it's hallucinogenic in nature. It distorts time and space. And we want them to understand that it does something very specific in the brain. It affects the endocannabinoid receptor system. We want them to understand that it is fat soluble. And this is another big one that really gets athletes' attention. Um, and I'm just going to explain it to you real quick because it's good to know. Um, Alcohol is water soluble, it gets into your body, it makes a person high, it washes out of the body within 24 hours, 36 at the latest. It washes out through the excretory system. So you pee it out and sweat it out and breathe it out. Marijuana, THC, quite different. Gets into the bloodstream, goes to the brain, it makes the user high, 
while they are still high, your body starts pulling THC out of the bloodstream and depositing it into your fatty tissues around your body. Um, this is actually how your body handles all kinds of fat toxins, fat soluble toxins. So in this case, when you're done being high and, and the, your body's more at stasis, um, your body will start leaching that THC back into the bloodstream and sending it to those excretory systems to, to, to be removed. So breathing, sweating, peeing. So when that's happening, it's the tiniest little bit of impairment. Most people don't seem high or act high or feel high when that's happening, but that is what gets picked up in drug tests. So if you ever hear someone say, tested positive for THC, but I used like weeks ago, I don't get it. This is why it stays in the system. Um, and, and also, like I said, for most of us, we wouldn't feel the compromise, but it is kind of a tiny bit of compromise. If, if a person were to take a highly calibrated physical or mental test, memory test, that impairment can show up on that type of test. So that means, again, we can use, can compromise skill development in the coming weeks. So that is a big deal message for athletes. They're like, oh, and some of them actually have real experience with that. So it, it aligns with their experience in addition to being information they didn't know. Marijuana has very neurological impacts. We spend some time really talking about the brain and its adaptability and, and frame this idea that really your brain is your game. You know, it is your most important tool. And, and what does that mean? We spend time, again, talking about that endocannabinoid system so they really understand CB1 and CB2 receptors and anandamide and that THC takes over that system and knocks anandamide off of it, and it wins all the time. Um, we, we want kids to understand, because lots of kids and parents, too, will say, well, if my brain's doing something that my body, you know, or if marijuana is doing something that my brain does naturally, creating its own cannabinoids, you know, doesn't that make it better for me? We go through and explain why it's not better, that too many cannabinoids shuts down receptors on the receiving side of the brain. This is a real physiological event. We show them what normal brain MR look, MRI looks like, what a marijuana brain looks like, and then what we want them to understand is this endocannabinoid system really governs movement, memory, and motivation. And so that is athletic performance. And um, we go through what, uh, we'll do an athletic example of catch the ball and how it cycles through the brain and these different regions of the endocannabinoid system where, um, you know, and how that brain is functioning. We talk about faulty feedback and we do a quick, you know, overview of, of marijuana and potency just so that they totally understand. Um, okay, so then we, we show a quick video. It's a lot of kind of science-based information. We kind of break that up. I'm not gonna show it to you right now. And then we talk about nicotine. Again, we've had a depressant, something that's hallucinogenic. We have now, um, this, uh, one second. Okay. Um, we have the stimulant in nicotine that it overstimulates the adrenal system. We're back to water solubility. We want them to understand the physical impacts of nicotine, uh, that it, that it creates this cycle where it, um, uh, makes gives a person a burst of energy and then it resolves really quickly it's one of the reasons why it's so addictive and that it also uh, does this thing called vasoconstriction which puts this really kind of hyper intense load on the heart and the lungs just when a person is sitting still something athletics is already doing we also want them to understand that any use via your lungs, whether you're smoking a cigarette, whether you're vaping, whether it's nicotine or THC, has some real implications. It down regulates the effectiveness of your lungs. It also impacts recovery in a in kind of a way different than alcohol does. And we find that athletes who use via their lungs are have less endurance, they recover and heal more slowly, they're weaker, and they generally suffer more injuries. 
So those are the those are the three majors, and then we um, spend one minute talking about opioids. We know the fentanyl crisis is real um, and really really dangerous. Um, athletes experience or encounter opioids through sports injury, so it's also very germane. We want them to understand that's addictive, we um, and that they need to use opioids as directed, and then. Quick public service announcement, making sure everyone understands heroin is also an opioid. It's just manufactured on the street, sold through street channels, and that fentanyl is this very supercharged, potent opioid of which a tiny amount can kill. We also want them to understand that you know all street drugs uh, can be compromised now. So cocaine, meth, ecstasy, MDMA, you can't take those anymore because so many of them are just fentanyl and either are laced with fentanyl or just completely replaced with fentanyl. And then we have this fake prescription pill, new phenomenon where people order Adderall and Ativan and you know what they think is a prescription drug online and it shows up as a fentanyl pill. So that's our kind of public service announcement there. The last major topic we talk about is addiction. Um, and we always say, you know, why do you think we're talking to a bunch of 14 to 18 year olds about addiction? And it is because A, you can become addicted when you're young and marijuana is the drug most teens are in rehab for right now. But also we understand that adult addiction starts when you're younger and we want them to understand they have this opportunity and ability to protect themselves. We want them to understand it's a chronic disease. It's more like diabetes than it is like breaking an ankle, that their brain is fully developed, not until 25 and that addiction can be hereditary. And, you know, we say that and, you know, we say several things about that, but ultimately the, the play, if you think you have addiction in your family is delay. You want to push off that start as long as you possibly can. We find kids armed with that information can be quite prophylactic. If we are um, talking about addiction, we do want to kind of give some perspective. The addiction rates, according to NIDA, are 15 to 20 percent of people that drink are have a problem. 30% um, of people who use marijuana have a use disorder. And then 85 to 90% of people who use nicotine are going to struggle when they try to stop. And that one we always like is tricky, right? You think with vaping, you can kind of get in and out of that easily. But in fact, only 10 to 15% of us can do that. Um, we do have a video on addiction that's great. Again, not going to show that to you right now, but highly recommend it. And we end by basically saying something like this, that substance use is weird. Everyone always thinks everyone's using. All parents think all teens are using. We try, we, we encourage you to bring in your local use data um, that generally shows not as many people are using as we all think they are. Now, if your friends are all using, it doesn't really matter what the data shows, it feels like 100% are using. And so we so we we give the kids this information because we want them to know it, but also to say, you know, when we walk into a room of athletes, we assume most of you are not using, but we know some of you might be. And Substance Free Athletics wants to be at least one voice if you are using that asks you to stop. And there's some really great news about stopping now. And it is that the same thing that makes you more vulnerable, um, your brain's adaptability and um, its elasticity is the same thing that makes it easier to stop. And it's the same thing that's gonna repair any change that may have occurred from the use. We spend one minute talking about withdrawal if we're asking them to stop, we wanted them to know that withdrawal can be quite real, just a very high level. It is discomfort. It is physical and and or emotional discomfort that can be very severe or kind of mild. And um, the main thing we want to tell them if they are stopping and if that's difficult for any reason to get help, we encourage um the local community to include what all of their help services are. Most of our prevention coalitions have all kinds of things that are going on in a community and or the school district itself does. And we wanna get that out there for everyone to know. 
So that is kind of how we, those are the two major components of the program that we share with coaches, with um, athletes, and with parents. It's one of the ways in which we create that commonly understood narrative. And I'm trying to see what time is. Okay. Um, and uh, and then we spend about 15 or 20 minutes additional with each of those stakeholders. With um, uh, with the athletes, we go through, this is actually the Protect Your Game Challenge. We break them into smaller groups and we literally throw these five questions up and have them talk through it. And this is a, we spend five minutes doing this. And it's, you know, obviously you can see it's what you hear about the presentation that stood out. We want to try and anchor some of this more detailed information for them. And then just these things. Can we commit to being substance free this season? What challenges might we encounter? How can we support each other? And what are alternatives? And they they say amazing, amazing things. We have them share back out. And what we think we're doing with this challenge is these things. We are empowering the non-use voice among teens. And we're, we're validating what so many of them already kind of believe is probably true. But this context of sports is, is giving them this really organic place to kind of express their beliefs and naturally influence each other, we think, because there is this kind of external goal, which is winning and performing and connecting with each other on the field in a way that produces the best results athletically. Um, and we do know that we are enabling, we, we are giving them ownership of this topic. The number of, their teens, some kids never think about this again, but the number of kids that tell us they have thought about it, or they got with someone else on their team and they made this a priority, or the team captain stepped up and said, okay, we are, you know, no one goes out alone on Friday night. I mean, it's, it, it takes all kinds of forms and shapes inside the team population. So that's great, right? Um, and I think with that, let me, let me just say, so that's our, our athlete piece and kind of looking at this time with with coaches and with parents with coaches we just want to have a discussion about coaching alcohol and drugs we want coaches to have the opportunity to think about you know are there alcohol and drugs on this team it's not something that's in the coaching manuals that we can find so far we know every year that's going to be different some years it is some years it's not we want them to think about if they're coaching out if they're comfortable coaching it we, we hear all kinds of responses from coaches. I'm not sure if it's part of my job. It's too complicated. Don't have time. They don't pay me enough. My parents would freak out. And there's a million reasons why coaches don't really approach alcohol and drugs that are all quite valid. Um, and, and we always want to tell coaches, if you're not coaching it, we promise you most coaches aren't. And we can also promise you most parents aren't. Um, and one of the reasons none of the adults and teens lives will kind of address alcohol and drugs head on is because of something that we call the hypocrisy conundrum. And every every adult that we get to share this information with tends to have a, oh, OK, kind of an aha moment. And this information is that our kids today are using less than we all used when we were in high school. So this is monitoring the future data, and you can see the red line has alcohol use going down since the 1970s into the early 2000s. Cigarette use is going down, illicit drug use is going down, the blue line, the only drug that's going up is marijuana, and that's matching our legalization movement, so it's not surprising, but, but so it's all going down. Now, that said, kids drink and drug very differently today. We know that six pack of beer shows up as a handle of vodka now to a party. We have these binge drinks in a can with four loco. That's just massive amounts of alcohol content. Weed is supercharged. Vaping has brought nicotine back onto our radar screens. And we have this just general ethos that a pill can solve all problems. So, you know, it's the, there's a lot going on that's intense. It's not trivial, but 
overall, if we collapse all this, um, you know, reduction in use and flip it, we see that that number at the far right, 36% of our high school seniors have not used anything according to Monitoring the Future. And, and that's mind blowing, it's just mind blowing. And, and it's mind blowing for me, because if I go back down that line and look at that low point, that's 1983, that's the year I graduated from high school. 3% of us had never used alcohol, marijuana or nicotine. And that's true, 97% of us had, that was absolutely 100% my experience. So this idea, you can see the conundrum, right? How do I, as an adult in a, in a teen's life, ask them to behave differently than I did. Once we kind of look at that, most of us go, oh, we can because we're the adults and it's appropriate to have two standards of behavior. And we have those two standards because of the you know, three, four decades of research that we have now about brain development, about substance use, that kind of thing. So it, it gets rid of some of that ambivalence and just kind of, you know, kind of casually for some and very intently for others motivates them to, to figure out how they feel about alcohol and drugs. With coaches, we also want them to understand their influence, that they really can normalize alcohol and drugs on a team or not. And we don't want to burden coaches with one more thing that they have to do. They're busy. They do amazing jobs already. Um, but we just offer some suggestions, you know, kind of Tap into who you are as a coach is and what this topic means to you. If it is an important, powerful topic for you, some coaches have some really intense experiences with drugs and alcohol as a coach in a family well, on a team. Share that with your team and you know, don't hold that back. That's really um we, we hear all kinds of stories from coaches when they share with their team an experience that they had, like, you know, a teammate in their youth that was going down the down that path and they didn't step in and they wish they could, would have the, all kinds of things happen for that team when the coach is sharing that kind of thing. Um, if that is not your style as a coach, you don't have to become an anti-drug warrior. Um, I'm a prevention person. I feel like I'm talking to a lot of prevention people right now. This is my topic uh, that the rest of the world doesn't feel like drug and alcohol prevention is the most important thing in the world. Shocking to me, baffling to me, but okay, I get it. If you're a coach where it's not your issue, just watch how you respond to your team. When, when you hear that war story on Monday of so-and-so was so drunk or so-and-so was so high, or I can't believe so-and-so made it home, you know, don't laugh, don't smile, don't high five, roll your eyes, walk away. Some kind of, you guys are idiots, you know, verbal, your communication, whether it's really demonstrative, pulling a kid aside going, okay, what's going on? What can I do to help? Or rolling your eyes, you're sending real communication. So we just want coaches to think about that. We spend some other time, spend more time talking about contracts and consequences and positioning statements. And we'll spend a little bit of brain one-on-one -on -one time with coaches. With parents, it's kind of the same thing. Parents are unbelievably busy. It is hard for them to show up to anything. Most of them are just trying to get through a day. If we can get them to show up to this session about um, substance-free athletics and their kids' sports, we want to take advantage of that. We want to really look at that a childhood onset disease understanding of adult addiction. We want to make sure they understand it. Um, we want to talk about family uh, history. We want parents to understand that youth use can cause mental illness as well as be evidence that there's some underlying concern. We want parents to understand that their influence really, really, really matters. And if you are the parent of a high schooler or have been, you know they are masters at convincing you you don't. They are masters at either acting like and or are just not listening, but we know that their influence matters. We also want to talk about the three gateway drugs for adolescents because we know all substance use is related for kids. Um, we want them to understand the hypocrisy conundrum and a little bit about brain development as well. Um, 
And we want them to understand the opportunity of adolescence. For as messy it is as it is, there's some really great stuff going on. And when we understand it, we just are more productive adults in teens' lives. And we end with resources. So let me see if Allie is on the call at this point. I'm here. <laughs> okay. Hello, Allie. Um, so this is the phenomenal um, prevention uh, coordinator oh, at Lyme, from the Lyme Old Lyme um, Prevention Coalition when this was happening. And she's going to take us through uh, kind of implementation and how they did it there. I, Debbie, before I, I go, Ellen had a question and it's yeah. in, in the chat. I don't know if you want to touch base on that and then I'll head into it. It's Only because it's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. What do you do when schools where there are teams that have a zero tolerance policy that includes removing anyone for using substances during the season of the team? We just, we just want everybody to understand that we were not, um, we do not go in and make policy recommendations at this point in time in the program. Um, we see a wide variety and we just want everyone to understand that. Some of these policies are quite, quite um, intense or severe, some people might say. One of the things we hope this program does is it gives the why behind some of these policies. You know, these policies generally come out of wanting real health for kids and want to protect kids themselves and who's competing against kids. So, so yeah, we don't, we just want to make sure everybody understands it. Awesome. Okay. okay. Um, so there, Emma, do I need to move the slides for you? Do you by any chance have control of the slides? Uh, I don't. Okay. okay. So I'm Allie Bangy. Um, thank you for bearing with me. I, I had a medical appointment, so I needed to get to. So I'm back, and I'm so happy to be here talking with all of you. And I think I recognize some faces from lots of prevention work around the country, um, which I think is phenomenal. It has been such an integral part of the work that I do in prevention here in Connecticut. So I, um, I had the pleasure of being the Prevention Coalition Coordinator for the Lyme Old Lyme community for three years, uh, almost four years, and been working with Debbie for three years of that time doing substance-free athletics within the Lyme Old Lyme community. And I have to say it is one of the um, foundational prevention pieces that we have incorporated into our community that has really filtered out into other um, prevention efforts and is really the cornerstone of something that almost everyone knows um, now in that community. They would tell you, uh, they being community members, that protect your game is what they recognize and is kind of everywhere. Water bottles, um, you know, banners at all our fields, uh, in almost every baseball from T-ball up, you know, we have ads that go into all of these different booklets. So pr protect your game has become something, um, you know, that is integrated into everything that we do with, with athletics. And like many communities around the country that, you know, that we get to speak to through substance free athletics, sports is really, really important in the Lima Lime community. So I can share a little bit about the work that I did there. And then I'm also, um, I recently took a position in my own hometown um, as the executive director of our youth, um, youth service bureau. And we are probably where many of you will be at the very beginning stages of, um, substance free athletics. So I get to do this journey again and see how implementation might work from the ground up and, um, you know, for a, just a different, a different subset of key stakeholders and everything above. So data driven, everything's data driven. I think, uh, you know, we get asked questions, why, why are we targeting athletes? And I always kind of come back with 71% of the Lyme Old Lyme community it, it has some involvement in athletics. So it really just makes sense. That being said, um, also always honoring the fact that, A, we have other students um, working other activities that are not athletic and reaching out to them in those ways and also helping to um, community or helping kids feel that we're not targeting them because they are athletes. Um, that's coming up in the community that I live in. Kids feeling like 
you know, you're targeting us because we're athletes and you think that we're this, we're that. So that's something that, you know, we're always talking about and why are, why are we addressing it? We're addressing it because sports are important to you and we're addressing it because substances directly impact the sports that you play. Um, so same thing in our middle school, lots of anecdotal data. Um, we will have some real numbers. We're hoping soon because our every two year survey is coming up in Lime on Lime and there are questions specifically related to protect your game and substance free athletics. So that'll be very cool to see uh, data and how it has impacted kids choices and kids behavior. So stay tuned for that. Um, I'm sure Debbie will share if it comes out. So steps to implement. And the thing that I can stress that CAD kind would like to stress here is that take whatever works for your community. Every community is so different and um, including the communities that I work in. Some things work, some things don't work with substance free athletics. Um, and then one of the beautiful things about partnering with substance free athletics is the continual um, roadmap of what does your community look like and what might you need, um, you know, as we've gone through three years worth, those presentations that Debbie was talking about, specifically the athlete presentations, I had kids who would say, this is great information. I really, you know, really important to know, do I have to sit through this both in soccer season, lacrosse season, every single year of high school, which is a valid question. That's a lot of time. And they're, you know, and they're sitting there quietly and behaving and thinking, oh my gosh, we have to get out to the field. So one of the things that I, you know, did with Debbie is how do we get this information to those kids? You know, they've had the information, they're talking to their coaches, but rather than sitting through it, you know, can we come up with some power discussion? So that's kind of where Lime Old Lime is heading now. So if your soccer player heard it in the fall, maybe in the spring, we're doing, you know, the prevention coordinators going in and doing a 15, 20 minute follow up. Um, when I'm, you know, in Connecticut, marijuana is legal now. What do you think about that? And just kind of sitting together in the space. Um, and I think for our kids, that really worked. They felt heard that, you know, how many times can you bang this across our heads? And we're here and we're listening, but what are you going to do to keep this interesting? So that's just one, you know, one way that Substance for Athletics has kind of met our needs as a small community. Okay, Debbie. So relationships and buy-in, I think this is huge. Um, you know, seeking out who your power player is, who your, you know, I call them our prevention heroes. Ours happens to be our athletic director. She's absolutely amazing, um, has really taken the Substance for Athletics and Protect Your Game messages um, you know, to a whole new level. I can say when we first started the first year, she was pretty nervous. Um, and we did it in baby steps and Debbie walked us through it, uh, starting with a coach's meeting that was invite, you didn't have to come, you know, really respecting our coaches time. And, you know, we had a few coaches come and we've just built upon that. So as the message has become, um, you know, an integral part of, of the work that the athletes are doing, more coaches are buying in. Hildy is more bought in. She really believes in it and is seeing the changes in the kids. So now, you know, our coaches meeting would be mandatory. Um, something that, you know, she has strived for. She's gotten credits from our overseeing organization, the CIAC, so that accounts for the coaches, honoring that they, they are there, but really pushing that they be there and how important it is to be there. Um, and that same thing has happened with coaches or with um, parents, finding creative ways to to get in front of um, different populations in a in a stronger way every year. So it's been a three year process. Um, yeah, this is all of what I think I said. Um, lots of this is just kind of how we did it. Make it easy with the kids. Let's make it easy. We have a leadership group of athletes. I think I can show you a video soon. But we have one young man. Um, he graduated now. Oh, there you go. You can show Maddie. Go ahead. So she's she's off the college. Is it going to play, Debbie, or no? No, one more time. <laughs> oh, I feel like it's, there it is. I think the substance-free athletics message regarding athlete drug and alcohol use has caused athletes to now think twice about their decisions and overall caused them to want to perform better and um, be more committed to their team because they realize that their decisions not only impact themselves, but also their teammates. Yeah, so Maddie's an example, at least in our community, of a young woman who she was actually not on my prevention radar as a youth advocate or part of our pre youth prevention coalition. She stepped forward when we hit the substance free athletics and protect your game field. Um, she's a three season athlete. 
obviously committed to prevention efforts, really came forward, but she found her voice through through um, substance-free education and prevention and sports. That's really how I get connected to Maddie, which kind of astounds me because she became such a key figure for us. And she's, you know, she sat on Debbie's national coalition of youth, but she, uh, she really found, she found her voice when it came to, to sports and substances, um, as opposed to, you know, all the other plethora of prevention things that we had been doing. So she's a key stakeholder, a way to start early. Um, so make it your own. This is how Lime with Lime does it. We are big on protect your game games. They're themed games. Every sport, every season has one. They've grown and they've changed. Usually um, some key leaders from each team will make posters. There'll be swag. The swag's gotten cooler as years have gone on. We have socks and hats and um, I think some giveaways now. This was last year during Red Ribbon Week. Um, every game was during Red Re Ribbon Week to tie it into, um, you know, the whole Red Ribbon thing that's going around the country. But we also were able to have all our high school kids go down to our middle school lunches during Red Ribbon Week and talk about you know, you know, staying substance free, making a positive one choice and all of the awesome programs that are going around around the country and really tying it into the protect your game message. Okay. Again, another example of, um, you know, our super cool kids. Um, this was a basketball game, I think, but they were, you know, they go up into the audience. I learned very quickly, I would attend these games and be there as a resource, as a prevention person, but kind of send the kids out there and parents will ask questions and they hand out flyers. And we do have, um, we have a lot of parents that we reach that way that we don't reach in typical you know, workshops or trainings or evening events, um, a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations, really asking the kids, what is this all about? And um, I think I shared a Katka and it's, and it, I love the story, but one of our volleyball players, when she graduated, uh, her dad came out, she had that, you know, her big face on a stick, you know, that they do and they're walking around senior night and he came and he stuck a protect your game sticker right in her forehead. And he told her right out in the center of the court that he hopes she carries the message off to college, which I didn't know him. I'd never met him. Um, and obviously, he really cared about the protect your game message. So that's just the prevention, um, you know, those things that we don't know are happening behind the scenes and why I'm so glad that the community work is happening um, and that it's not happening in the ways that I always think it's happening. Um, it's just organic and it feels good. And the kids really love it. They buy into it, which is half the battle. The younger kids, the middle school kids think it's the coolest thing ever. Um, so when the high school kids give them socks and give them swag and invite them to join their teams later in high school with a substance free uh, mindset and choice, it goes um, farther. You know, I, I want to see the data, but I think it's going to have a huge impact. So anyway, there's the little guys. So this is some of our soccer players last year going down to the middle school um, during a practice and talking about what living a healthy lifestyle means to them, going to all their lunches. And then do you want to share? So Aiden is a... Um, He's another one of those prevention powerhouses who didn't come forward until Substance Free Athletics. He was the captain of our soccer team last year. He's playing soccer in college, um, still working on trying to get him to come back as a college kid and talk about uh, the choices that he makes. But he's he's pretty profound. So we can share. Yeah, actually go him. talk with the middle school soccer team about um, drugs and alcohol and its harmful effects and my personal experience, experiences with it and I felt the need to be very open and honest with them. I told them, hey, I have been offered alcohol before. Hey, I have been offered drugs before, but I have turned them down because of every harmful effect it may cause. I told them my personal history with like my family line having alcoholism and drug addicts. While I do think that anyone talking anyone speaking on their behalf as like a personal story can be really effective um, to like preventing the youth from going down that path. I do think part of why it was so well received by the middle schoolers was that I was a high school captain on the soccer team. And I think that was somewhere where they wanted to be. They wanted to be the captain and um, they wanted to, I don't want to say they wanted to be me, but they wanted to be in my shoes eventually when they got to their high school, when they, or when they got to their senior year in high school. And 
I feel like being in that position of power, being in that position they wanted to be in just helped me get my message across much clearer because I've I have talked with middle schoolers before, but not ones that I can say I've had common interests with or yeah, it's no, not ones that I've had common interests with. And they tend to be much more ignorant of the message that I'm trying to send. Um, so I believe that coming from somewhere where they wanted to be really just helped me give them that message. And the, after they asked questions, they wanted to know more. And um, it was honestly really exciting for me because normally when I talk to younger people, they don't ever want to listen to me. They just want to get the, the speech over with. And I just felt like the fact that we had that connection in uh, common with the sport, um, it just really, it really helped. I did actually so I know we're running short on time, yeah, so I want to leave some. Oh, I want to leave some some questions for everybody. If you have any questions of me, of Debbie, I know as far as implementation goes, if you're ever involved in substance for athletics, I'm completely available to anybody who has questions or wants to brainstorm. That's one of the beautiful things that happened for me um, working with Debbie is just kind of always going back and forth of what will work for a certain community. Okay. Okay, thank you so much, Debbie and Allie. Um, I'm just gonna leave it open. There's only 18 people in our group right now. We're recording, but if somebody, if you just wanna unmute yourself, Alice, I see your hand. Yeah, I just very quickly, I have to run to another meeting, but I wanna thank, um, we have our athletic director, our social emotional learning director and um, the director of ENU, um, all um, Jermaine Smith, all attending from Ossining. And I'm so grateful that they got to hear this from Allie and Allie and um, Debbie rather. Um, thank you both so much. Um, I've got to run, but I'm really grateful that we got to offer this webinar. You guys are amazing. And um, at CADCO, we had a room of like over 200 people just absolutely mesmerized by this program. And I know I spoke to Debbie last week and she said she's been deluged by people um, in terms of wanting to implement the program. So I'm really glad that Nota Prevent was able to do this. And thank you, um, Linda, for organizing it. And I'll be in touch with our Austin folks soon. Thanks, Alice. Okay, bye-bye. Good seeing you. Good to see you too. If any of the school and 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 sports folks that are on the call have any questions, please pop up. We're happy to answer them. Um, yeah. Um, I, um, this is Jermaine Smith from Austin. Um, I have a question. I'm a coach and have a community organization. Um, one concern I have is with the the suspension, and um, especially for for African American community, it's one of the the, the issues we have. Um, within, um, and not just asking in general, but just in school districts, that the um, the higher rate of suspension for African American youth in this, in this school districts. So I'm curious as to how that's played out in other districts or conversations. Um, is there an alternative suggestion you have to that? Um, so I'm just curious about that from that perspective. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it is a topic that's a little outside the purview of the program. Um, like I said a minute ago, we don't do any policy recommendations at this point in time. Um, we, I can tell you we are increasingly seeing policies that have a um, social justice component to them where a first offense results in you know, a certain kind of you know, educational program, notice to parents, you know, kind of this opportunity to cure, if you will. So we are seeing that, um, not in everyone. You know, we do, we still see a lot of zero tolerance uh, policies as well out, out there. And, you know, I think it's something, you know, each community needs to keep looking at and, and, uh, and finding their way forward you know, yeah. in a way that'll work. So I can, 
I think I can speak a little bit with our community and, um, you know, one of the things our athletic director would tell you, because we've had this conversation on the unfairness of certain kids getting, you know, away with things that other kids are not getting away with and are allowed to, to uh, kind of slip past the rules is one of the things that talking about this out loud every year in different settings with parents, with um, with coaches, with our administration is bringing more awareness to the fact that equality has to happen. If you're going to have rules, they have to be rules for everybody. And that's, and I'm saying that from my, you know, this very small Shoreline, Connecticut community, but that has been something that um, has been plaguing a lot of people is why, why is it happening? You know, why is one kid kicked off and the other kid it's looked out, you know, the other, the other way, because that's the star player or whoever that kid is. And, I know that she would tell you that conversations have really started to open up around that. And so there is hopefully some shifts and some changes and team by team by team, um, you know, looking at looking at that. And that's, you know, hopefully heading in the right direction. Oh, thank you. You're welcome. Are there any other questions? Otherwise, we're right at one o'clock. And I would just end with one question um, for anyone on this call who is interested in bringing this program to their district. I would just ask, where would you say, where's the best place to start? And, you know, is it the coach, you know, once we learn about the program, is it the coaches meeting? I know Ali talked about having a coaches meeting that wasn't mandatory. If you could just give us some direction from other schools that have brought this in about the best way to approach? Yeah, I'll start. Um, so first of all, if you are interested, that QR code will allow you to tell us who you are and we'll get in touch with you as well, even though I think there's a lot of connection here in this group. Um, and or you're welcome to reach out to us directly. But most of the organizations that we work with in school districts start with the coaches meeting. And, <clears throat> and it's usually, and we look at the year in terms of seasons, and we usually do Actually, honestly, we almost always get started in the fall. So we do the coaches meeting in the winter as the first stop. But you could do the fall coaches meeting. You could do the spring coaches meeting. And lots of times um, we even position it and the people on the ground position it as a pilot. You know, we're looking at this program. We think it's really valuable, but we really want to get your opinion. And so we do the conversation with them a, kind of in that context. And then part of that conversation is, um, okay, how could we talk to your teams? What's the best way for us to talk to your teams? Because again, coaches are, they, they have a lot going on and they have a lot of opinions about if or, and how this is going to fit. And, and some honestly just can never make it fit. But some really do have, okay, if you will meet with me at three o'clock on Tuesday, we can spend 45 minutes. Really, that's my only day, you know, so th there's some real specifics. So you have that conversation with them. Sometimes the athletic director knows that information ahead of time. So we can go into that coaches meeting with some, with a plan or with a proposed plan. And then we're just getting coaches to say yes or no, or modify it this way. Sometimes it's more open. And and then it just goes from there. I mean, honestly, the, I think Allie kind of said this, the parents sometimes end up being the hardest group to really get somewhere. And we would just want to talk about and explore in that local site, okay, is there anything that parents have to show up to right now? You know, so can we piggyback on that? Okay, if there's nothing parents have to show up to, is there a parent education committee that's looking at parent ed more generally? Can we be a program one month in that parent ed committee? So you, you're looking for the way to get it to parents as, as seamlessly or as, you know, as easily as possible. But that's where we generally start. Allie, would you add anything? Yeah, I would say exactly. Find your... I you know, quite often your athletic director is such a huge advocate and resource, a good place to have just a general presentation. And I know Debbie and I would both be happy to talk individually with any, you know, ADs. Um, sometimes it's a youth, some kids come forward and spearhead, and that's a good way because then you can, you can infiltrate that way. I think that's kind of the approach I'm taking now in my new community is we have some kids who are interested in having a conversation with the athletic director, you know, that this is a possibility, like this is a possibility. So um, that's a good place to start. And then just, yeah. 
I know for us, it was just start slow and it's built momentum because our idea is we don't want it to be a one year thing. We really want it to become a community wide um, from, you know, small little league all the way up language that all families have around protecting your game. So just a year by year. And sometimes you get told flat out no by certain teams and that's okay. Um, you know, and sometimes other teams, you know, might have a teacher who then, you know, integrates it into her curriculum in the classroom. So it's just this huge span of, of utilization. Just sorry, I know we're trying to end, but to that point, if you have youth ambassador programs inside your coalitions, um, that is just starting to show itself. I, we have a girl who's on the council now, the National Council from Maryland that I met at CADCA. I've not met one adult that she is in relation, you know, in association with, but she's on her local prevention coalition group and she is a runner and this means a lot to her. And so we're starting, you know, if you have that, that youth organization, that might be another place to float this idea and see if anyone pops up. And then like Ali said, sometimes it is the athlete going to talk to the AD. Hey, I, I, did someone have their hand raised? I'm sorry, I can't see the name. Yes, can, I'm sure. sorry, your name isn't showing up, but if you want to just do your quick, if someone, if yeah. you guys have to leave, feel free, I'll take this last question and, uh, or two, and then we will, we'll close down the recording. But if people have to Thank go, you. I understand. Thank you. Um, so I have a question and in order for the, there to be a zero policy in place, what is the burden of proof for a coach for an athlete who they suspect are taking drugs, can they prove it? Can they force testing? So is there is there some kind of litmus test to say that this athlete is using and therefore we can kick them off the team? I, I know they don't want that, obviously, but I'm just curious about that. That the answer to that is going to be state by state and district by district. Um, you know, there are states out there that drug test all their athletes, period, end of story. If you pass, you pass. If you fail, you fail. Um, Even in high school? High school? Yeah, 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 okay. for sure. Um, they tend to be Southern states. You won't be surprised. Um, but they're, in our community, I can tell you, the burden of proof, there's a definition of that. And um it does in our community include uh, social media uh, and um, eyewitness sightings, and and that and it's a real vetting process. So if someone you know says you know Jimmy John was drunk this weekend, or you know that they there has to be proof and it has to be validated. You can't just do that, you know arbitrarily and you know to try and get a teammate in trouble that's it's not designed for that but if there is actual evidence and that coach can see the evidence and that evidence is brought to the coach or that coach sees it you know then that kid can be suspended um i'm in california so suspension there is no zero tolerance policy here and um the, yeah there's there's a, a, an attempt to not suspend. Well, I mean, our suspension is not kicked off the team. We have a graduated suspension. So first offense is a week, second offense is three weeks, you know, fourth, third offense is five weeks. So thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to thank everybody for coming. I will send out the um, recording to the group that was invited to attend this event so that if you want to share it with anybody. And again, thank you to Ali and Debbie for joining us today and explaining the program to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank